Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all of the sponsors of our Health Equity series, including Deloitte, Microsoft, and Lyft. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joined us from Microsoft, Jen Roth. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Really excited to be here with you. Um, first, I just wanna introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Megan Callahan, our Vice President of from Healthcare uh, for Lyft. Dr. Shantanu Nundi, the author and Chief Medical Officer at Accolade. And Christina Baer, our Vice President a product marketing industry at Microsoft. Welcome everyone, nice to see you all. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. Great. So I just wanna kind of level set with all of us, you know, as we know that the healthcare industry has really been impacted by COVID-19 in unprecedented ways. And I think with all of us, the pandemic has, you know, had such a substantial global impact and in many ways it raised the bar on what we needed to collectively deliver as an industry. And I think just to level set with everyone, you know, health equity is about, is really achieved when every person has that opportunity to attain their full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving that potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. However, there is ample evidence that social factors, including things as racial and ethical, uh, ethnic in discrimination, education, income, gender, um, employment status, you know, they all have a marked influence on how healthy a, a person is. And by reducing and challenging some of the, the obstacles, people can really achieve health equity, but it's rarely something that a person can do on their own by themselves. It really does require adaptive change from the industry, from communities, regulators, and governments. So I'd like for each of you to, you know, kind of start out um, as we talk about, you know, these challenges of health equity, you know, what types of things we've we've all seen uh, as part of the, the pandemic, but, um, you know, certainly all of your organizations have really looked at creating a system that is much more resilient to these stresses of the unforeseen events and highly being highly responsive to the needs of individual patients and populations and providers serving them. So um, I'll start with you, Megan. Well, tell us just a little bit more about yourself uh, and Lyft and what you're doing in healthcare. Sure, um, and thanks for the opportunity again to, to be here and uh, you know discuss this really important topic. So, um, Megan Callahan, VP of Healthcare for Lyft. I've been at Lyft for about three years. Um, we work in the non-emergency medical transportation space. Um, over 20 years in healthcare, um, previously at Change Healthcare and McKesson. So uh, within Lyft, you know, even pre-pandemic, um, every year, 5 million Americans um, could not get to a medical appointment because they, they lack transportation. And that is the problem that Lyft is trying to solve. Um, these individuals are disproportionately um, lower income, older, people of color, um, have disabilities or chronic illnesses. And NEMT, non-emergency medical transportation, is a covered benefit under Medicaid, and it's increasingly covered under Medicare Advantage. And obviously, there's a very rich conversation, um, particularly with the Medicaid population uh, and health equity, which I'm sure we'll, we'll delve into here, Jen. Um, I did want to just take a, a moment to just level set on what Lyft is doing in healthcare to solve that problem around missed, missed appointments and really, I think, the most fundamental kind of of healthcare access. So um, we are, it's, it's different than you calling a, a, a ride on your, on your phone and you paying for it yourself. So Lyft Healthcare works with um, transportation managers, health plans, health systems, organizations that want to arrange a ride for a patient and pay for that ride um, for that patient. So we have a platform that enables them to do that. The member or the patient does not need to have a cell phone 
um, we can we can call landlines to let them know where their driver is, or certainly if they do have a cell phone, we can uh, provide text messages. Um, I think one of our most recent innovations, though, does if they do have a cell phone, they can initiate a you know a ride from their phone, and and we think that that's really important to give these members agency. And so we'll, we might talk about that in a little bit. Um, and we were certainly very involved in the healthcare space uh, since 2016, and that was just exacerbated by by 2020 and the pandemic. Thanks. It's so great to have you here, Megan. Uh, Dr. Nundi, how about yourself? Yeah, well, it's uh, great to be on with 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 these folks. And uh, so I'm a primary care physician, still practice in the safety net, and then I'm also chief medical officer at Accolade. Um, and maybe I'll start by you know sort of the first part of your question, um, which is which is you know what were the challenges we saw you know on the ground? You know, so my clinic it's a little five clinic health system in in DC that serves predominantly, you know, uninsured uh, immigrant population. And, you know, I think for us, I mean, I think really um, COVID was a, was a magnifying glass, right, on the challenges that people have accessing care generally, um, you know, from, you know, the challenges of, you know, just getting into appointments, um, like, like Megan talked about, um, some of those logistical barriers, um, clearly financial barriers are still huge. Um, despite a lot of the care that we provide is pretty low cost and in some cases free. Um, trust is a huge barrier. You know, I think there is a long standing history of the medical community uh, mistreating folks of certain communities. And, and I think what that means is that if we're doing innovation or improvement that starts on the clinic walls, a lot of people just don't feel comfortable coming uh, through those walls. Um, and so what all of those things I think amounted to was, you know, kind of similar to the K-shaped recovery, right, is seeing, um, you know, people disproportionately harmed by COVID, but also seeing their preventive care, their chronic care, their mental health care um, getting significantly worse um, during the pandemic. And then on the other side, something that I'm sure we'll talk more about, Jen, through the conversation is, you know, a lot of, you know, driven by necessity, a lot of really promising changes as well. Um, I, as someone who's practiced in the safety net maybe 15 years, really for the first time in 15 years, it's, it's actually changed for the better in meaningful ways, right, with drive-through testing and telemedicine. We'll get into all this, but um, I think so it's kind of on one end, it's a magnification um, of those disparities. On the other end, I think some real reason for hope and some lessons uh, that I hope we carry forward. Yeah, so important. I um, totally agree with a lot of lessons learned, a lot of things, good things to, to keep sticking with as we move through these these next few years. Christina, I'd love to hear from you and, and introduce yourself and, and what your role has been at Microsoft during this time. Yeah, no, thank you, Jen. Um, so my name is Christina Baer. I am the vice president of product at, at Microsoft or a vice president of product at Microsoft. I specifically focus on healthcare and frontline workers. It's uh, it's an incredible honor to be here with Megan and Dr. Nundi. Um, my background is a little bit different. Um, I am an engineer and a technologist uh, for about 18 years. Um, and about three years ago, my father had a cardiac arrest and witnessing that was really life-changing for me. It's, it's really Really spurred a passion on how can I go take my technology background and apply that to supporting healthcare heroes. So, um, you know, in at my current role, I specifically work on how do we support care teams, as well as how do we think about um, evolving and innovating on things like virtual visits. Yeah, amazing. And I know the work you do, Christina, I've worked with you quite a bit in your team. So I'm really excited to have you here as well and share in this discussion. Um, okay, so let's dive in. Uh, you know, Dr. Nundi, you talked a lot about uh, community involvement and how that you have helped, you know, see that uh, increase health equity and access to care. You know, how do you think about that from the individual level versus the community level? Can you give some examples of, you know, the types of things that you have seen uh, in your work in primary care? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, it, I think when we, if we focus on the problem of access within the broader context of health disparities, I think going back to that point I made about um, if everything we do to improve healthcare starts in the clinic walls, you already lost a sizable percent of the population just right off the bat, you know, even with innovations like Megan talked about. And so I think it becomes critical, you know, we all have that saying, you know, meeting people where they are. Um, that is the starting point. Uh, and for some people meeting where, them where they are means meeting them online and online I think is, is a huge, huge potential for that. 
And there's a lot of other places where people are that we can meet them, right? So, you know, in my clinic, for example, we partnered with the church to, uh, to do mass vaccinations for COVID, right? Um, we partnered with community organizations to actually canvas going door to door, helping people get back into clinic for their, for their care or, or schedule um, them for appointments. Um, mobile vans, you know, as we're seeing now around the last mile of distribution for folks that are uh, homebound or other issues like that. But I think that's the core principle. And, and I think for me, the lesson learned is, you know, yes, healthcare should be virtual. Yes, it should be home-based. But to me, the, the, the way I frame it is it should be distributed, meaning that it shouldn't start in a clinic or hospital. It needs to be distributed closer to where people are at home, in the community, at work. Um, and it needs to connect across those different care settings because oftentimes home and virtual is great, but it's often a starting point, not the end. And so that's sort of the concept that I um, that I, I think a lot about. And, and Megan, I know with uh, Lyft and and your work with transportation, you know that's that's obviously a lot of what Dr. Nundi is talking about. You know that that barrier for equitable healthcare for many sometimes it might just be as simple as transportation and getting into those locations for access to care. Can you can you talk a little bit about what Lyft has been doing to address some of those issues? Sure, um, happy to. So you know we do millions of healthcare rides every year. Um, trying to get uh, those 5 million uh, people to their healthcare appointments every year. In COVID, obviously, um, you know, having everyone uh, needing to get to a vaccine, that 5 million number went up to closer to 15 million in our estimation. Um, so one of the things um, that we did was work with over, you know, you were talking about community, Jen. I mean, we started partnering with over 150 organizations, both national, local, and hyper, hyper local. Um, so that uh, members of the community who did not have transportation covered under a benefit under Medicaid or Medicare Advantage um, could call in to, to those organizations and request transportation um, in to get their vaccine. Um, we also transported over 200,000 healthcare workers um, as public transportation shut down around the country, certainly academic medical centers, um, places that were a little bit more urban uh, where trans public transport was either greatly reduced or completely shut down. We helped get those healthcare workers in so that they could take care of COVID patients and certainly deliver vaccines. And then we also pivoted, you know, we talk a lot, I obviously talk a lot about getting medical care, but, um, you know, as, as people were shut in, I mean, this trend of, of care in the home, you know, just took on a, a whole other, a whole other level and vulnerable populations who couldn't leave their home, we really quickly pivoted to bringing food and meals on the behalf of health systems and payers um, into those vulnerable populations um, homes. So I think it just showed, you know, really the importance of, of, of transportation um, in healthcare. And certainly, you know, we did our part from a philanthropic standpoint. I think, I think what that really shows is that you know, philanthropy is, is fantastic and, and, and we were happy to do it and our partners were happy to do it, but it's not a long-term solution. Um, and these people who needed to get to vaccines, they need all kinds of other care um, that they're, that they're you know, they, they're putting off often um, getting because they, they, they can't get a ride. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's such a great point and great to hear what your organization did during that time um, and pivoting. You know, I think that's what a lot of organizations had to do. Um, and certainly, Christina, I think your organization was pivoting really quickly, um, especially with innovation, you know, um, to address that equitable access, but also you talked a lot about the frontline worker. So, you know, what are some of the things that um, Microsoft did as, as part of this, you know, as part of their response in these ways? Yeah. So, you know, Microsoft as a whole, we're focused on three, improving three areas. So we've got vaccine equity, um, AI for health equity, and then also third, um, uh, decreasing the digital divide. So as an engineering uh, leader, I'd like to focus most of our, I know the most about decreasing the digital divide and, and how that can be used to unlock the potential in order to address health equity. So Microsoft has been working with teams on a worldwide basis to really understand how can we improve the underlying infrastructure with things like access to broadband, how do we think about digital literacy programs, 
And this also comes into play in our products like virtual visits, which is how can we help communities um, that are underserved dramatically increase their access to care when in-person care isn't required or isn't, you know, frankly, as accessible as it could should be. So um, we have integrations into EHR systems that allow care teams in different areas to collaborate. And we're seeing it uh, an interesting growth in healthcare providers teaming up with retail clinics like um, Walgreens and Target. And this is particularly prevalent in the early days of administering the COVID vaccines. And you know, having a secure way to share patient information and notes about these systems are really key to helping addressing these um, healthcare inequities. So just making sure that we can enable care teams to talk to each other and sharing pertinent information is, is super important, I think, in order for us to help, help folks uh, deliver the care that you know, all of these um, populations deserve. So, um, you know, in, in my world, in virtual visits, we think a lot about how there are underserved communities that are very, are disproportionately affected by chronic diseases, and they have limited access to healthcare with geographic barriers. And so, you know, when we think about improving patients' access to preventative care and modern diseases, um, it, when, you, when you have into focus folks that have limited access to transportation, you know, um, you know, considering what Lyft is doing there, I think it's like a lot of complementary work and you have to take off time to go off of work and go into the doctor's office, just having virtual visits as part of that mix on delivering care, I think is super important in order to, to help these, these folks. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and, and some of the stats I heard, uh, Christina, just from the amount of virtual visits that, that went up, you know, just from an industry perspective, where a lot of patients were seeing, you know, you, you were talking maybe on average 30% of virtual of visits were virtual in the past. And over this year, it's grown closer to, you know, 70 to 80% of that. Um, yeah. And a lot of different, and I think Dr. Nundi, you, you talked a lot about, you know, some of the different ways, um, some of the different types of ways, not only for treating chronic illness, um, you know, but also things like mental health. You know, certainly uh, with with things like this, you know, how for all of you, you know, how do you think we need to address these surges kind of for the needs of that safety net population during, you know, normal times, but how can these services become more responsive? Um, you know, and I just think there's a lot here with that we're talking about with telehealth, but then with, um, you know, real-time data. I think Christina just, you know, you talked a little bit about just making that connection between that data. Um, so Dr. Nundi, we'll start with you. Um, what are your thoughts around that? And then we'll go around the panel. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, just, just a quick comment to your last thing, which is, you know, at least in the safety net, and not just my clinic, but I have a chance to, to talk to safety net leaders around the country is we were doing 0% virtual um, before the pandemic, zero. Literally, I'd never done one in my life. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and within two weeks, we were up to 80%. Um, and now I would say my practice is probably in the 40% neighborhood. So just to say, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a massive, massive transformation. And, and I think that, you know, I'll say that someone who's a healthcare delivery junkie, I've learned a ton. Like, I think it surprised me in so many respects. Like, I'll tell you one surprising fact was, you know, my no-show rate, you know, clinics, often have people that aren't able to attend. And part of it's transportation, part of it could be childcare, or they, they have to trade off losing a day's wages versus coming, right? It's a very complex set of factors. What was really interesting is early in the pandemic, my no-show rate, which for the last few years has been 15 to 20%, dropped to almost 0% as, as all of our visits were virtual. And I think what it made me realize was, you know, people's barriers didn't go away, right? Uh, their barriers are their barriers, but, but the simple fact of care being accessible virtually, you know, where people could be working and then kind of step out for five minutes, get on the call with me and get back to work uh, or with their childcare, whatever the barrier was, was, was life-changing for them. Um, I also started seeing patients who literally I'd never seen before. I had a lot of first time visits and I'd ask them, I say, Hey, you know, um, I noticed from your record, you haven't been here before and we're the only safety net clinic really in our area. And I said, yeah, because before I, I couldn't ever come to these visits and now you guys are doing virtual. And so I did a lot more establishment of care visits for people. Um, and then you said mental health. I mean, that was, I'd say really surprising as a physician is that um, 
you know, I think I was really, I mean, when people have mental health concerns, you know, they're tearful in clinic, you know, you sort of want that reassuring, you know, you know, you know, you know, someone holding your hand. I found it curiously intimate, you know, uh, actually, and, and I actually created less of a me doctor, you patient interaction. And it was much more, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's because I FaceTime my, my mom or whatever, but it, it created this very intimate sort of relationship where I felt like people were able to be much more open with me about it. Um, and then certainly the fact that I could keep following up more easily, I'd say, hey, why don't we talk again next week? You know, it, it wasn't a big deal, you know, where you're scheduling them six weeks out. And, you know, for someone with serious mental health issues, you don't want to wait six weeks for the next appointment. At the same time, you don't want to necessarily have them come in just a week later and miss another day of work and stuff, right? So anyways, just some, just some observations. I'm not totally answering your question, but I just, for the audience, I think just that context of just how much learning there was and just how much change really happened. And now we're sitting here saying, okay, well, what does this all mean? Yeah. You know, is really the go forward question. Can I, can I pivot yeah. off of those yeah. last two comments? Cause I, I think it's really interesting. We did a, we did a survey with Evidation at the end of 2020, where we surveyed 9,000 Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries and really tried to find the, the relationship between transportation and security and um, access to healthcare. And what we found is transportation insecure, which was generally defined as being 65 years um, or older, you know, people of color, low, low income, et cetera, all the, all the characteristics that we probably know. Um, they missed appointments or ran, run, ran out of medicine at double and triple, sorry, the Medicaid and the duals. Um, they had double and triple the rates of missing appointments and running out of medications than straight Medicare beneficiaries. So that really, I think, puts the spotlight on those two populations. And if we think of that, of telehealth, right? So it's fantastic that 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 hopefully those people were able to get in during the pandemic and, and uh, take advantage of, of, of telehealth. But that makes me think of, of the work that Christina is doing around the digital divide. And, you know, transportation is probably, you know, the canary in the coal mine around all different types of access. And if we don't solve that digital divide issue, then we've got the physical barriers around transportation. That's certainly one manifestation. And then you've got, you know, how are they going to get into a telehealth visit and how do we solve for that? So, um, Christina, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what Microsoft is doing there, but I think that'll be like the next big thing to solve, or it is right now anyway. It's it's literally about access to healthcare, you know, physical or virtual. It's all kind of part of the same story and the same problem that we're trying to jointly address uh, as a as a healthcare community. Um, and you know, Dr. Nundi's points are are so spot on. We hear this all of the time. And, you know, even pre pandemic. Um, you know, we've had physicians talk about, you know, an oncologist talk about how meeting with patients virtually in their own homes was a much more supportive environment where they could have their family members, their community there, um, and kind of like more intimate, more frequent check-ins and how that can um, significantly improve care outcomes. I think that has been a fascinating um, kind of like Oh, uh, aha for us as a company is like, how can Microsoft really lean in here to provide virtual visits so that these healthcare heroes can go connect with the communities that they're trying to serve, serve so much. Um, the no-show rate, again, is another one that we see a, a ton of improvements on. Um, so outside of just like the fundamentals of being able to easily join a virtual visit, um, we've, we've done a lot of work on, hey, we know that even just downloading an app can be tough. Right, so what can we do to support, you know, mobile uh, browser join where you don't have to create a login? You know, like what can we go do to like accelerate innovations there? Um, there's been a lot of work around SMS notifications and how we can see if you send someone a text message like, hey, your appointment is going to start in 10 minutes, how that also improves our no-show rates. And then, you know, the other thing is, is that. Um, we, we realize the power in a lot of the partner ecosystem, and there's a lot of great um, partners of ours or, or providers that supply interpreter services. So how can we bring in an interpreter into a virtual visit that can break down you know, barriers around languages or disabilities with a deaf or, or hard of hearing? So it's like taking this technology as that platform and then really inviting um, the community of healthcare heroes to kind of take advantage of that so that they can, in turn, 
turn also address some of the the inequities that we currently see in, in healthcare. So it's um it's a really good like feel good story. I feel like we are in um we're playing an awesome team sport, you know, and Microsoft's here kind of like trying to get get technology to in the hands of hands of um, these providers so they can go make a difference. Yeah, and I think that, you know, from the work uh, we've done in healthcare, I think we've certainly seen across the board different things like telehealth, but then artificial intelligence, you know, using something as simple as a bot to ask questions, uh, to triage, you know, patients before they would go into the ED, um, you know, with potential symptoms only to find out it was more of, you know, kind of a, you know, uh, an allergy or something like that, or a simple cold, a cold, but really helped to support again, you know, kind of that influx of people that were coming into the EDs and maybe slow that down. But I know that when they started doing more virtual visits, we just, you know, started to see that, that kind of uh, almost like a calm, you know, kind of come down. And I think Dr. Nundi, you, you mentioned something um, as well, you know, with those visits, like you having that more, uh, you know, that more connected moment with your, with your patients. And I think the other thing that we had seen was, you know, doctors were able to actually see the types of environments people were in and, um, you know, be able to maybe get a little more insight into some of those, those things, uh, you know, that might be more environmental that might be causing some of the, uh, some of the areas of concern. Um, were there occasions where you were able to just have that broader connection, you know, with your patients and the communities and, or, or ways that maybe you talked uh, with your organization on, on how you can address that uh, type of thing moving forward? Yeah, no, massively. I mean, so far what we've talked about is, is access, which access is obviously the starting point, but ultimately what we're all, I think, interested in is getting to better health, right? And, and I think one of the things that I worry about in this moment of, of this, all this amazing change is that what we don't want to do is take a really broken, you know, you know, uh, brick and mortar healthcare experience and recapitulate it online. Right. And I think that's particularly true around social determinants, right? Uh, we have such a lack of visibility into the barriers that people face at home and in their uh, social contacts that impact their health. Um, the other huge one is chronic conditions, right? That, this idea that, well, I'm going to see you today, give you a bunch of things to do, and then I'm not going to see you again for three or six months, and then I actually expect you to show up and have done all those things. You know, we have decades of research showing that that's, that doesn't work, uh, and it just honestly doesn't make any common sense either. And so I think some of the really exciting stuff I've seen is taking this shift to at home and virtual and really saying, well, wow, how could we use it to reinvent that care experience? And so you're right. I mean, one of the big ones is, is yeah, the, the video as a window into someone's home environment. I think that's, that's huge and something definitely I took advantage of as a physician in a pretty unstructured way is just, you know, having people say, hey, can you show me your kitchen? Or, hey, are there other family? I was talking to someone who, who um, was older and had some cognitive impairment. I said, hey, do you have a daughter or son or someone who's home with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, let me call them. And, you know, and they got on the video and suddenly I'm learning all this stuff about lost keys and all this stuff, which, you know, I've been taking care of this patient for a long time, but it's easy to sort of um, cover those things up when you walk into a clinic and you're there without your family. Um, and, then on, and then on the, the continuity side, I think we completely need a, a sea change there. Um, one of the examples this is a little bit, you know, personal is that, you know, early in the pandemic, you know, my mom has type two diabetes. She's had it for 25 years, been on higher dose of insulin for 10 years and never had it controlled. And during the pandemic, she kept hearing how if you have diabetes and you get COVID, it'll be worse. She said, that's it, I'm doing something about it. And, and she signed up for an online service where she had a 24 seven health coach to work on her nutrition. So she can message that person day and night. Um, she had a, a virtual doctor who she saw more frequently. Um, she had a wireless glucometer and ketone machine that was sending her data to that care team. And then actually the real linchpin for her was they connected her with a gentleman who lived halfway across the country, um, who's from India, like we are, and eats similar food to who my mom swapped recipes with. And literally 25 years with diabetes, 10 years on insulin. And my mom within three weeks got completely off of insulin. Um, and now a year later, she's still off with her sugars completely controlled. And, and, and that's what it took, you know, it, it took 
that kind of continuous support um, ultimately to change. And so it's a long-winded answer, but like that's really the direction now that I think we're starting to build the architecture for access. Now we got to say, wow, well, how are we going to get those outcomes that have eluded us, not just during the pandemic, but for decades now? Yeah. Like, well, we should probably just end the whole webinar on your, the story of your mom, because that's, that's so, inspi so inspiring. And I think we all want that for our loved ones. So <laughs> congratulations. It's a fantastic story. Um, if I could pick up on what you were talking about with respect to, you know, kind of where I was going with it was with data and codification. So I've talked about this in the past, but you know, as you think about telehealth and you getting this this window into people's real lives and what might be a barrier to care, I mean, we have a huge issue just with our data infrastructure and the fact that, you know, I don't know, you probably put that in some unstructured note. And then, you know, if your patient left and went somewhere else, would that survive? You know, who who knows? So one thing that Lyft is really passionate about is, you know, we we support the Gravity Project, was, which is a, a way to get data standards around social determinants of health so that we actually have a code um, that physicians actually use around transportation insecurity, food insecurity, housing insecurity, whatever it would be, so that it's part of the digital record um, and it follows that patient. And so everyone around uh, the entire care team can be informed and understand what those barriers are and, 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 and make long lasting decisions. So, um, you know, I think we're, we're a ways um, from, from getting there and having those kind of codes be, be utilized. But I think whether it's in-person care or telehealth, um, as we as a nation recognize that we're going for health and not health care, I think that's data infrastructure that we definitely need to invest in. Yeah, and I think that's that's a great uh, bridge to, you know, health and you got to think about wellness data as well, you know, just as Dr. Nundi was saying, you know, is, is mom being able to do that? Uh, it, it, you know, even having just a wellness coach in, in those types of environments, you can see the longer term impact when we're thinking about it more broad, you know, not just healthcare, as you said. Yeah, no, so I couldn't agree with Kevin, uh, with Megan's point more. I mean, just to add another story that I still think about to this day is I've been taking care of a patient for some time who's got a chronic uh, uh, a pulmonary or a lung condition. And she came to clinic and she said, hey, you know, Dr. Nani, I need your help. I said, sure, you know, what is it? And she said, well, and this was in the beginning of the pandemic. She said, well, there is a, I'm homeless and uh, there's a new program. I'm in, I'm in a shelter, but there's a new program with the county that um, if you can write me a note that says I have a chronic condition, well, they'll put me in a hotel. And it just broke my heart um, because I've been taking care of her for a while. I didn't know she was homeless. Um, and you talk about data, what's interesting is her, her address that's in the system is actually a known homeless shelter, mm. right? But all I have in my EMR is the address. I didn't, I mean, it didn't ping any public database to say there's a homeless shelter. And then the other thing that really, again, just in, in really embarrassed me was I, I had heard on NPR about these programs to help people get into hotels. I didn't know that there was one in my own county, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And, and that's the other part about sort of data and decision support, right, is even if I knew she was homeless, I didn't necessarily know that that was something that I could prescribe or do for her, right? And so I think, I mean, I think Megan, just underscoring Megan's point with the story, which is just that like, yeah, I think some of that data doesn't, some of it can be rocket science. Some of it doesn't have to be that hard, you know, but it's, it's really taking, you know, adding more data, translating that data, and then making that data, right? I mean, classically actionable. I think, my, my biggest thought after that day was how many more homeless patients do I have who I could help that I don't know about? Exactly. And I, I literally had no way to query my, my, my roster and, and, and understand that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. That connection with data, that's, that's just been something that we have heard uh, over and over again between the, the connection with just healthcare organizations, whether it be payers or, um, you know, healthcare providers to even public health data, um, being able to share that data back and forth, uh, and especially during the pandemic was, was probably one of the biggest challenges um, and why some organizations and some communities couldn't accelerate, you know, even vaccines and, and things like that um, and the distribution of those because the connection wasn't there, um, you know, in, in all times. So, so as we're, you know, thinking about um, the, you know, the future, I think, uh, and and I hate calling it like the 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 new normal because it's not going to be normal ever again, right? You know, but 
if you all had a crystal ball, what do you think would be some of the most, you know, impactful changes that we could make to really improve health equity and improve the responsiveness in the future? And I know, Megan, uh, when we were talking yesterday, you talked a lot about policy. I would love for you to talk a little bit about how you think we need to do something broader around health policy. Yeah, so we spend a lot of time on policy at Lyft, um, you know, given uh, Medicaid and, and Medicare and, and certainly even with telehealth, Christina, right? You wouldn't have seen, and, and Dr. Nidhi, you wouldn't have seen that huge increase in telehealth visits if it wasn't for policy. So, you know, basically if there ain't no policy, they ain't, there ain't no money. <laughs> um, so, you know, and benefits, I'll just take NEMT obviously, cause that's um, what Lyft does, you know, those benefits can be, can be tenuous. Um, so unlike um, other mandatory Medicaid benefits, NEMT benefit was initially described in regulation as an administrative requirement. It was only specified in statute in December of 2020. So up until that time, you had different states doing 1115 waivers to uh, be exempt from providing um, uh, the NEMT benefit to their Medicaid members, you had the Trump administration considering making it optional. So that policy and kind of enshrining NEMT as part of the Medicaid benefit was incredibly important for Medicaid populations. I think there's more work to be done. So right now, Medicare fee-for-service populations have no NEMT benefit. I'm sure that's one example of many. In an MA, Medicare Advantage, only 35% of beneficiaries have have a transportation benefit. And we really saw that during the pandemic, right? In all of those populations. And lastly, I'll just say from a policy perspective, and I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this. It's been in the news a lot over the past 24 to 48 hours. If you think about the 12 states that have an expanded Medicaid and those, you know, four-ish million members um, who are, you know, certain percentage underneath, I think it's 138% under the federal poverty level who are in this, you know, this gap. And how do we solve for those people in those in the in those states for all kinds of benefits, obviously, not just NEMT. So, you know, I think as COVID has really, as we've all talked about, laid bare all the inadequacies inadequacies in our system, you know, now is the time to really push hard um, for policies that we think will, you know, help these populations so that when the next the next crisis comes, you know, we're in a better, we're in a better position. Yeah. Uh, Christina, that's from you. You know, what what types of things do you see kind of moving forward into the future? Uh, you know, and how how we can keep this uh, access to care, you know, and and technology, things like that. Yeah, we we're continuing to evolve our our technology stack around virtual visits and and how do we think about um, data and and empowering those care teams. But I think fundamentally for us and, and for me personally, it's about listening to you know, uh, physicians and care providers and trying to understand what they need from us, right? So like, I think uh, my perspective is a little bit more in, a, in the enabling, like how can I understand better you know, Dr. Nundi's mother's story? So can we create a blueprint to scale that type of approach and empower a lot more physicians to go do that type of thing? So, so what I, uh, I think that this next era for, for us is, is, gonna, is gonna be very customer and partner driven. And it's gonna be listening and trying to figure out how we can play, play a, a role. Cause you know, I think the thing that we understand is that um, industries and healthcare in particular, it's complex. Right, and it's not going to be a one size fits all, and it's not going to be a one company serves all. It's how can we kind of like work together and serve serve all of the all the people that we can. Jen, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Okay, That's let right. me start. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone do it. Uh, so Dr. Nundi, let's talk a little bit about, you know, from your background, what, you know, what types of things are you hopeful for, for the future, even technology that you, you know, really want to see us move forward with and, and other changes um, sure, for the health sure. uh, Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, I always get on a one soapbox during these conversations, because we're talking about health equity, I just want to make one really important point, right, which is no amount of technology, no amount of philanthropy, no amount of innovation is a substitute for the fact that everyone in this country needs basic social protection, which means we need universal access to high quality healthcare coverage. And, 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 and that's 
that's just the fact that you know how we do that's a political thing i'm not going to get into that but i don't want anyone listening to think that that there's a substitute for that there is not and i think the pandemic revealed that probably more than anything else i think on the second thing of of solutions i mean i'm similarly not very prescriptive about it because i think that every community is so different some are online some aren't some are rural some are not but really the framework that i've developed is really um, around three dimensions, right? First is care needs to become more distributed, which I mentioned earlier, right? It needs to start at home and in the community. And there's models like, you know, like telehealth, there's models like hospitalizing people at home. There's a ton of things we need to do to drive way more care to begin at in the home and in the community. The second, which we've talked about a little bit is digitally enabled. Care, care is between, care, the word itself is between two people. But we need to enable that with with data. We don't we don't. There's no way we're going to replace that. But right now we're doing that in a data poor way, right? So like we talked about the data around people's social determinants, whether that's um, access to um, to expert information, which is something I imagine that Christina works on a lot, which we don't talk about a lot, which is that a lot of providers that work uh, a lot of the care we give in clinics that are in those vulnerable communities is lower quality, and in part because they're less resource, they're more resource constrained, they don't have access to the kind of talent um, and processes that provide for high quality care. So it has to be digitally enabled. And then the third um, is decentralized. We need to put way more resources in the hands of frontline care teams and patients themselves. A great example is, you know, Oak Street uh, in Chicago, where because they get, they get paid, you know, based on uh, the risk of their, their population as a lump sum, what they did is they went from actually transporting people to clinic to the, the early part of the pandemic, actually turning those vans around and having them deliver food and medicines into the home. And so those are really the concepts. It's gotta be distributed, digitally enabled and decentralized. And then each community needs to decide how to actually execute on that to best advance you know, the outcomes they're trying to achieve for their population. And Christina, I know that, um, you know, especially in frontline workers, we saw so much, uh, you know, just as Dr. Nundi just kind of said, you know, just rethinking the norm uh, with the way they were doing, uh, you know, things like rounding, uh, you know, patient roundings and, and going into patient rooms, uh, you know, even, even training new medical students. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how you can kind of see that future maybe moving and expanding access to um, things for frontline workers as well and the technology side or otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that there have been a couple of like ahas for us uh, as a business on, on frontline workers. One is um, they have just been so underserved by technology, right? Like when you think about, um, you know, not just healthcare, but frontline workers um, are represent 2 billion people across the planet. And we, um, we just haven't empowered them to do be as effective as they can be, right? And um, you know, when we first started in this role, it was you know I had talked to folks and be like, please don't make me go in and sell PowerPoint to a doctor. Like they, that's not what they need, right? Like that's not what they need in order to be, uh, in order to deliver great care. So some of it, it was just on the fundamentals. Like how do we create a robust and secure platform that is as easy to use as a consumer chat app? Right. So like, how do we because like what we saw and what we observed in um, in some care facilities is that they were um, doing things that probably they shouldn't have because it was just easier. Right. And so what can we do to address that with you know, like mobile first technology, things that are very secure and compliant um, and and also can kind of bring data in from the EMR so people can have thoughtful conversations about a about a patient in order to serve them serve them better. So there there's been a lot of work for us in in frontline workers on building really great user experiences. How do we think about mobile as as the primary device for us to to optimize for? And then again, kind of like really working in concert with the with the ecosystem. You know, how can we wrap you know, our, um, the electronic health records in a, a bubble of comms and collab love so that we, we can give um, our frontline workers really great tools so that they can get their job done as quickly as possible. Like they're not sitting at a computer all 
all day, or at least they shouldn't be, right? So like it, when you consider a population that is very mobile first and they have a very episodic relationship with technology, how can you be like, be brief, be right, be gone with technology and like just get kind of get out of the way so that they can go do their jobs well. It's like a lot of the things that we're, we're focusing on. Great. Well, I want to open it up to our attendees. We have uh, approximately, uh, I think, 15 minutes or so uh, to see if there's any questions uh, online from the attendees for any of our panelists. And I'll uh, just check here in the Q&A. And if not, we can, we can batter around a little bit more on our side. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions from the participants. We'll keep an active eye on that. But um, I, you know, want to give everyone an opportunity. You know, just as you're, you know, leaving this webinar today, the work you're going to be doing, uh, what types of things are are you going to be thinking about now, moving into the the next, you know, six months to a year in your organizations around uh, health equity, and you know, what types of things are you going to be focused on around that area? And Megan, we'll start with you. Sure, right. Well, just because Christina was talking about mobile technology, I'll, I'll just give kind of um, something that we're working on that, that I'm excited about. Um, you know, typically in NAMT, um, it's an industry that's been around for a long time and therefore it is very call center driven. So anytime a, a Medicaid member or a Medicare Advantage member, there's a 1-800 number on the back of your card and you, you, call, you call that and you sit in a queue for X amount of minutes and then you get a person and yada, yada. So um, I think obviously what Lyft brings to the table, our superpower is our, is our consumer app. And, you know, when I started um, at Lyft, I think it was a lot of questions I would get around Medicaid and Medicare patients and would they use, would they use, did they have a phone? And, you know, 80 plus percent of them, 86, 80, up to 90%, they all have phones. They might have limited data plans, but they definitely have phones and it's really their, their connection to everything. So how can we set up a, a transportation program with all the budget controls, you know, so that it's administratively appropriate and, and, and ties back to a benefit structure, but so that person doesn't have to sit there and, and, and wait on the call center and take more time out of their work day, more time away from their kids, et cetera, and have the agency to use the Lyft app and say, you know, I'm going to the doctor, um, you know, health insurer X, Y, or Z is, is paying for it, click it. And they have a free and covered ride through their through their Lyft app. I think that's something we're really excited about in, in terms of creating agency for these these people that have phones. And by the way, seniors will use rideshare, and they do have phones, and they know how to use the app. They might need a little bit more TLC in the beginning, a little bit more talking through what it what it what it what it looks like. But we've had tremendous success in senior populations with rideshare. So I think I'm 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 very excited um, about that and continuing, you know, to apply, you know, what Lyft does so well um, in the consumer space to to healthcare. Wonderful. And Christina, where do you see some of the the next big changes in in your area and where uh, you know Microsoft is focusing on on healthcare? Yeah, there's there's a big push, at least on my team, from on just really jamming on virtual visits. Like, how can we think about integration into more electronic health records? Um, how can we think about a, a like a more robust workflow? So that, you know, you have a, an enhanced waiting room. How do we think about the actual visit, and then making it really easy to schedule follow up appointments and that that kind of flow, um, as well as what we what we chatted about before about on the focus of, on frontline workers is like really evolving their tool set so that they have everything that they need at their fingertips to to evolve quickly and i just want to like echo you know megan's megan's um comment you know my my father is in his 80s and is a huge fan of lyft and i think that's the bar that we've got to go jam on like we've we've got this long history of creating really robust enterprise grade products and like how can we take that and marry with like the ease of use and the customer experience that like you know grandma or, or grandpa can 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 uh, handle easily. Um, I had a conversation with a uh, in the early days as we were framing out our virtual visits products. Um, I had a conversation with a uh, uh, with a physician and she was sharing with me. She's like, I went to medical school. Don't make me teach my you know elderly patient how to download something and join a virtual visit. Like this thing needs to be you know, so easy that it's like, we, we internally, we call it like, you know, grandma proof, right? Like how can we make sure that this is uh, as easy to use as Lyft? That's great. 
And Dr. Nundi, uh, you know, talk a little bit about your perspective too, um, especially from, you know, the community health perspective, but then also some things you're excited about for the, for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'll start with the accolade perspective. So, you know, accolade where I'm chief medical officer is, um, you know, we provide um, personalized navigation to about 2 million Americans, which means, you know, we give them a health assistant, you know, basically like a travel agent for healthcare to manage the complexity of, of healthcare. And one of the things that, you know, as we're growing is we've expanded now uh, into primary care, which we're delivering virtually in all 50 states and to uh, and to expert medical opinion. So we have about a thousand expert physicians around the country. And I think as we're working on putting those three pieces together, I think we're thinking very explicitly about this health equity point. Um, one example of that is, you know, a lot of the sort of consumer oriented um, enterprise telemedicine services that I think we're hearing about in the news are very much focused on, hey, let's just make it really delightful, easy to use. And I think that's, you know, like uh, Christina said, I think we should have a high bar that's super important. And it's true that if you just kind of build those tools, they're often going to be used most by people that already have access on some level, who have some digital literacy, maybe people that are a little bit of the worried well that we uh, concern ourselves with. And so part of what we're trying to do is marry that with data. Um, so for example, we, we're pulling data on, on census tracts to look at where are their health professional shortage areas, and then specifically targeting those communities and saying, hey, we have this you know, virtual healthcare service for you. Um, here's why we think it makes sense for you. Um, so kind of combining, the, you know, sort of the, the people self-serving into the service and those that were like proactively using data to go grab and say, hey, you haven't seen a doctor in two years, you live in an area that's a health professional shortage area. We think this makes a lot of sense for you. And, and that's a big part of how we're thinking about it is to me, you know, um, health equity or health disparities is not a bug, it's a feature. And if we don't explicitly build systems in mind to address equity from the beginning, it's it, you know it's going to be very difficult to retrofit it on. And so that's really how we're thinking about building that new service. Great. Um, and I just got a question from the the um, group attending, uh, and I'll open this up to anyone on the panel who'd like to start. But you know, is it possible to balance scaled programs designed to address social determinants of health with trust of patients to decide what they need and the trust of the providers to manage the specific needs of their local populations? Um, our conversation has, you know, demonstrated the hyper local nature of kind of providing care. So, how can we build in maybe choice and flexibility? Well, I can take a little bit. I mean, I think some of that, right? What I talked about with with what we call lift pass for healthcare, and 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 letting a patient, you know, choose when they <laughs> like to leave for a medical appointment. So, just you know, historically, what would happen is a Medicaid patient, in particular, would be put in a shuttle. They would be picked up an hour to two hours before their appointment. They would go to their appointment, and then they'd have an hour to a you know three hour journey home, and that would take all day. And many times those people cannot take off work for that long, right? Or pay for childcare for that long. So that did not give them a lot of choices. So my hope is that with some of these technological innovations, we're giving them more, maybe not total choice, but at least a little bit more flexibility from a transportation perspective in terms of how to get somewhere. Um, you know, obviously I think with Lyft, I mean, our drivers are all independent contractors and from the community, right? Definitely a part of the community. Um, and we try, you know, very much um, to enable those drivers to support, to support the patients in, 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 in the ways that they can. Um, but it is a hard question around scale versus flexibility because, um, you know, there are benefit structures for certain social determinants of health and those benefit structures are like any other benefit structure. Um, and often providers might not be in the driver's seat. It might be the, you know, that the health plan that's in the driver's seat. So can that, you know, can we get to kind of a hyper-local lens there? I think sometimes you can, um, and sometimes it's a little harder, but I'd throw it out to the other, other panelists for their, for their views. 
Yeah, maybe something I'll add. I agree. It's a, it's a challenging question. It's a great question. I mean, I think trust is central to everything that we're trying to do. And I, again, to me, I go back to that digitally enabled concept. I mean, as a physician, uh, I'll often get patients who come to clinic and will walk in and be surprised like, oh, I thought you're a female because, <laughs> you know, they see the name Shantanu and Nandi, I guess they don't know. And, and I always feel terrible because you know, people's preferences, like we have preferences. There are certain types of doctors or gender of doctors that we're, we're going to feel more comfortable opening up with. So I don't think at least, you know, I don't look at, at Accolade, our job is to replace those doctors by any means. It's much more, you know, how do we give people the tools to, to find those local, you know, providers, those local services that they will find trustworthy and that they can create that kind of relationship with. And so that's what we're trying to, you know, digitally enable and then give those, those doctors and patients, you know, the best chance they have at creating that relationship, which sometimes means, you know, preparing them for the visit. So the visits organized and getting them there and things like that. But um, that's at least one way we think about the complementarity uh, of those two uh, competing ideas. Yeah, I think I think that's so important, and and more and more, I think people are getting used to that that personalized experience. To your point, you know, and and having that relationship, that more connected relationship with their physician, and and knowing a little bit more about them, and uh, vice versa. So I think the more you know, like you said, the flexibility and transparency we can kind of add into the system, I think, is really important for us moving forward. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes. Any closing thoughts from anyone on the panel um, before we close out? And everyone's quiet, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I think from there, you know, I just want to thank all of you for joining us. I know your busy schedules, and I really appreciate the time and taking on this really important topic, um, you know, for the, the health equity series. I think it's really great that we were able to join together and, and talk about what the future looks like. Um, so super excited to have all of you with us and thank you again for participating and thank you to all the attendees for today and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Yeah, it was a real honor to be part of this discussion. Thank you, Jen, for moderating. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jen. Thanks, team. Thank you.